Um, good evening to you all. On behalf of the Northeast Society of St. Stephen's College, I would like to gladly welcome you all to the inaugural event of the Society and the first lecture of our online lecture series. The online lecture series is an initiative taken by the Society to try and bring to our awareness the social, political, and cultural aspects of the Northeast. Over the course of this month and the next, the Society plans on having eminent speakers with scholarship in various fields to talk about the different aspects of the Northeast experience, such as tribal folklore and culture, religion, identity politics and imagined boundaries, and Northeastern history and tradition. The theme at hand for this evening is gendering resistance, women's negotiations with the conflicts in the Northeast. The society felt that holding this talk was necessary so as to make known the difference in the political experience of women in the Northeast, especially how they negotiate with cultural norms, progressive policies, military intervention, and religious teaching. Here with us today is Ms. Anna Bina Lakshmi Nepram, an esteemed scholar in the field of gender rights, female activism, and women-led gun disarmament movements. She's the founder of the Control Arms Foundation of India, which is a New Delhi-based gun control organization that seeks to promote gun control and curb armed violence caused by the proliferation of small arms and improvised explosive devices. She's also the author of several books. Her latest book is titled Alien of Extraordinary Ability, a book that deals with the journey of a young woman who strives to bring peace and justice in her native homeland and the obstacles she faces along the way. Ms. Nepram is also the recipient of various awards and fellowships, such as the Best Humanitarian Initiative of the Year 2010 Award, the CNN IBN Real Heroes Award, the Dalai Lama Foundation Scholar of Peace Award, and many other such accolades. With regards to the discussion session after the lecture, you may write down your questions on the chat box should you have any. Furthermore, attendees are required to keep their microphones off throughout the course of the lecture. Having said thus, we hand over the session to you, Ms. Nepram. Thank you. Uh, first of all, the Northeast Society, St. Stephen's, really uh, delighted to be here with you all. Um, and to be able to have this really important discussion on women's negotiation, gendering resistance. So kudos to you and all of your team members. And I'm really glad that uh, you know, the session will be recorded and shared with many others who have, are not able to join in right now because this is such a critical topic. Uh, so good evening, everyone who is tuning in uh, from, from around um, you know, and then also uh, when it's uh, sort of shared with many others would be listening to this. I will uh, start with this very critical uh, uh, you know, aspect of how, first of all, I will divide my, my sort of uh, you know, lecture into three parts. Uh, I will look at into, before we understand how do we gender resistance, it's really important to understand what is happening in the Northeast of India. And secondly, I will look into the impact of what conflicts has done to men, women, children, and the youth of Northeast of India. And my final point of how did women gender their resistance, particularly nonviolence resistance. Now, let me take you through a couple of, and I'll, I'll see if I can share the slides, because what I'm sharing today is based on more than almost a decade and a half of research, writing, analysis. As many of you are in, in the college and in the university setting, it is so important that we use this time to be able to find questions, answers to many of the questions which continue to be the problem and the issues that consist, uh, continue to be in the Northeast of India. So like many of you, I, I also am a product of Delhi University. Uh, I'm a product of Indiprastha College and Hindu College. Um, I did come to St. Stephen's to apply for my admission once. I do remember the corridors of St. Stephen's. So, you know, so fortunate that all of you are there and, and, and you know, imparting this knowledge in spite of the pandemic. Uh, I'm really glad that our literally what is so important is not just women's resistance, but everyday resistance that students like you are doing with supportive professors. And we are very happy to be with you in this journey. And I know this will be the beginning of many more journeys. 
and I have never believed in numbers. And if 10 people come together with the right ideas, we can transform the Northeast and we can transform the world. So let's uh, plunge ahead. And I, I'm, I brought to you many, like a, a couple of slides because this is really important to bring to light uh, an understanding of the Northeast because still now the concept of Northeast is just a direction, the Northeast, you know, everyone calls it as if we are a direction. Now, the thing is, so it's really important that till today, because the history of 45 million people, indigenous people of Northeast of India is not in the textbooks of the world's largest democracy. So people in the rest of India and, and the world doesn't know about us. So for us also in the Northeast, we are not knowing about each other. How many of you know about the Naga customs? How many of us know about the cookie custom? How many of us know about you know, the uh, uh, issues of the Garo, the Jaintias, the Kasis? I mean, we hear about them, but we are not learning about each other. So let me take you through a couple of slides which I prepared uh, so that it could be useful. Yeah. Okay. So I. All right. Uh, so if you look at the slides, um, like just a picture of this is an amazing picture of uh, Mizoram uh, Myanmar border. And as I, I would like to dedicate this presentation to the brave indigenous women of Manipur and around the world who have fought courageously because um, many of us are doing this work in recognize. So I recognize our, our women of the Northeast of India, women of Manipur um, and the youth who have really worked over years and decades and centuries to, to bring about the resistance that we are now you know, applying to our words. As I mentioned, I will give a geostrategic overview of Northeast, the human impact, and how are we negotiating? Um, and uh, yeah, and then what are the recommendations? Now, this is a very important um, um, map that I always share. This is just to give you an idea how the significance of this region. For the rest of India, the Northeast may be just a direction, but what is the Northeast of India? Even we don't know because we don't even learn of, about each other because of deliberate policies. First, this is a region of immense geostrategic importance. This region borders five countries, China, Myanmar, Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh. And remember the five countries which bind the Northeast. This is really important. So this 98% of Northeast territories are bordered by five countries, you see. We are joined with the Union of India by what is called Chicken Neck Corridor. I think it's a 22 kilometer belt between you see Nepal and Bangladesh. This little tiny area where you're seeing is where 2% of Northeast of India joins the Union of India. Keep that in your mind. Now, many territories were not historically a part of India before. This is important to note as a historical narrative. Okay. The reason is people of the rest of India usually think of the Northeast as land of jungles, you know, land which you know, needs, we eat everything that moves kind of idea. And this is so wrong. And, uh, and in this part of India, I'll, I'll like demonstrate through my lecture that it's such a critical, many parts of Northeast were Asiatic independent nation states. Some of you must be hearing this for the first time today, but let me remit. I am a trained historian, so I'm saying this through historical research. For example, Manipur was an independent Asiatic nation state and it joined the Union of India in 1949 under what many scholars call under duress, means under pressure. And Sikkim was an independent nation state till 1975. You know, so this is how many of us know this and which something which doesn't happen, it hasn't happened in the rest of India. We have a de facto martial law. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act first clamped the Naga Hills in 1958 and almost crossing all the Northeast states except for Sikkim and with the revocation of some of this act in other parts of Northeast, but it is this act, which was a British colonial act was clamped in that region since 1958. I want you to remember this because this is really important 
in what is happening there. Um, the other important thing, uh, many of us are going to be future, um, you know, academicians or future um, administrators, or future scientists, anything you want to be. <laughs> but uh, just to give an idea, this, this is, uh, now a lot of people think why the Northeast and really important in today's context. Just a couple of uh, months ago, I was inundated on Twitter by a lot of young students asking for support to, to save the Dehang Patkai area, stop coal mining and all of that. So I'm bringing this initial to the fore of this discussion because to really know that the Northeast of India is a very resource rich area. So many people think, oh, why there's a lot of fighting with this lot of militarization. Again, remember this in your mind. This is a resource rich area and efforts are underway to exploit them without a pre prior informed consent. You know, the, us, you know, uh, you know uh, we already, we have um, morning tea all the time. A lot of it comes from Assam, a lot of oil and natural gas under Nagaland, under Tripura, we have uranium in Meghalaya. So remember this, that this is an extremely resource rich area. And in Arunachal Pradesh and across the Northeast of India, 168 dams are being planned. So, and also, um, China is bordering the northeast of India. In fact, China has still not recognized Arunachal Pradesh as a part of Indian territory. They call it Southern Tibet. So look at the geostrategic conflict that you can see. We always think the northeast, but how we are situated in such a critical geostrategic location. China's one belt, one road passes through the northeast of India. So this is a very critical, this is a very important project aimed for completion uh, in 2040 by China and it passes through the Northeast. So really important uh, geopolitics here, which all of us, we need to know. As I mentioned, uh, just to give you the different parts of Northeast of India, uh, as, as I mentioned, Arunachal Pradesh, uh, contested by China, calling it Southern Tibet. Sikkim borders Tibet, you know, China. Uh, just to see the geostrategic importance of our region. Meghalaya and Tripura, if, uh, if you have been there, this is a picture of Ujjanta Palace in Tripura, which I have visited. And then Meghalaya, they both border Bangladesh. Mizoram, um, again in this, re I have been in this regions, they border both Bangladesh and Myanmar, you see. So we are actually living in very international lines. Now, the thing about the Northeast of India is if you, if anyone comes to India with an Indian visa, one is not allowed to freely enter the indigenous areas of Northeast. You need a, a permit called a protected area or restricted area permit. So this is, so as a result, many international, uh, you know, organizations and also like humanitarian aid organizations are not allowed in these territories. Ask yourself the question, why? The other thing is, this is very, very important. And particularly with what's happening with the recent gang rape of um, a Dalit girl in Uttar Pradesh. Now the Northeast of India, 45 million indigenous people. Remember this, we have 45 million indigenous people have been excluded from the Indian syllabi. We, if you look, if, <laughs> look at the syllabus, you know, all of us went through syllabus of this country except for the fact that, you know, the, the world's rainiest place is in Jerapunji, Mosin Ram in Meghalaya. Where do you find this amazing history of 45 million people in the Indian Sele? It's absent. In the Hindu caste system, you know, whenever a person from Northeast are, is in Delhi, this whole question of racism comes because we don't belong to the many of the caste system. Of course, there are with the Hinduization of many parts of Northeast of India, Hin the caste system reached but as indigenous people, we are not in the Indian caste system. So a lot of them are, of us are not even Dalits. We are what I could term as outcast. And in fact, it's very interesting in RSS literature and I've interacted with them if, oh, during the Justice uh, um, Baseball Committee report. And in fact, they call us Vanvasis, means people who live in the forest. And this is a form of racism. 
uh, you know, since Tiff is, is in New Delhi and I have grown up uh, literally like studying in New Delhi too. And I, when I was growing up in Manipur, my parents never taught us that we are different from other Indians. But when I came like all of you, like most of you to Delhi University to study, this is where I first heard the word chinky in my life. So it is not the people of Northeast who others, but it is the rest of India who actually othered us, literally. Terms like Momo, Chaumin, tribals. I mean, everything, I mean, they like, we have our names, yet we are called with these distinctions in a very derogatory way. And these are what are aspects of racial discrimination, though many people, in India, I think there is no racial discrimination. There is the racial discrimination in this country. Again, just to give an idea, the notion of India, you know, if anyone looks at the faces of Tagin ethnic people of Arunachal Pradesh, will they think that our faces are Indian enough? <laughs> so I, I, I'm bringing some of these images to see how distinct we are. These are the Lepcha people of Sikkim, really amazing, beautiful people. But will these faces identify as an Indian face is the question I'm asking here. Again, you know, I was a part of massive protests together with many, many student groups as well as associations from Northeast of India when Nidutania was beaten to death in the streets of Delhi in January 2014. An act which I called is, was, was India's George Floyd move moment, actually. You've heard about George Floyd, how he was beaten uh, choked to death in the United States of America. But here uh, we had a George Floyd moment much before it happened in America, 2014, January. I remember this so clearly, how Nido Tanya was rebuked for being not looking Indian enough. His hairstyle, his, his face, his race was joked upon. He entered into a fight and several men beat him to death. Uh, and this is what happened. So a lot of these conceptions about who we are, not just uh, young men of the Northeast of India, many indigenous women from Northeast of India have been trafficked, raped and killed in India's capital Delhi in a spate of gender-based violence. I have, be, uh, I have taken care of each of these cases. Julie, who was, beat, was killed in, in Munirka, Rengamfi from Ukrul in Manipur, uh, you know, a wonderful Naga girl who was, was um, you know, sexually assaulted and raped in Chirag Delhi in her rented apartment. And Dana Sangma's case from Amity, who was found dead in Amity in, 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 you know, in uh, Maneshwar. So these are just to let you know that, and why did, and a lot of people ask, why are people of North East, why are you coming out from the region? And this is because of the conflict because of years of conflict, decades of conflict. So there is a lot of internal displacement I'll share. And a lot of young people come out from the region to study, 66% of people who come out from the Northeast come to study for higher studies. You know, Many of us, uh, our parents give a lot of importance that we should be educated enough. They will sell our family farm, our rice fields to ensure that we get educated. This is who we are, what we are. But then yet we are always told that we don't have civilization, we are not cultured enough. So this is uh, uh, some of the very tragic things. As I mentioned, during COVID-19, we are right in the middle of a pandemic where the cases have reached millions in India too. And during COVID-19 coronavirus, people from Northeast were not allowed to enter grocery stop stores, asked to leave rented apartments, sped at. We were called corona carriers and told to go back to China. Think for ourselves, think for, for a second, is this fair? So the kind of work that we from the Northeast together with friends of the Northeast, people who care about human rights, people who care about basic humanity, we also have a lot to reflect together. Now, I'm gonna now take you a little bit to a microcosm just to give you an idea of what is the Northeast and why these conflicts have come. And I'm taking you back 
to a journey of where I come from, the Manipur nation. The word nation, people may think it means states, but it means nation also can mean a group of people who are speaking a different particular language in a particular region. Okay, that's how I use the word nation. But just to, to bring you a context. So what was Manipur? Manipur literally translates land of jewels, was an Asiatic nation state annexed by India in 1949 after the British left. It is home to 39 ethnic and many diverse communities. As I mentioned, the word annex was not used by me. It was used in Shillong times, if you see the report here, uh, and it was the merger with India was termed unconstitutional. And that's why the conflict in Manipur started in 1949. While some Manipuri said it's okay to join with India, some we did not, uh, which did not agree, they went, uh, you know, uh, in un uh, literally underground and started the political violence in Manipur against uh, what might call annexation by New Delhi. This is a picture of the large Ma Maharaja of Manipur signing the uh, merger agreement under duress in Shillong, which is Manipur's uh, king's summer capital and it still exists. What is interesting is if any of you here remember that India's constitution was written in 1950. India's constitution was taken from the constitutions of various countries, including United States. India took many parts of its constitution from the Irish constitution, from the British constitution. Well, think for a moment what Northeast of India means to you. If you know this, that Manipur had its own written constitution in 1947, much before India wrote its own in 1950. I want you to take a moment to remember this. The Manipur Constitution Act was in operation. And this act, what does it say? It, it sort of formed a council of ministers. We had the chief minister, which is the prime minister equivalent. And Manipur had universal adult franchise in 1947. We had our own elected representatives much before India got independence. So this is the level of our political maturity which because our history is not there, no one knows about it. Now, which brings us to why there is so much of conflict now in Northeast of India. I just gave an example of Manipur and same thing with the Naga movement. Why did it start again? You know, we all know that right now the, 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 the peace talks, the Naga peace talks have been happening since 1997 for 22 years. Until today, there is no kind of, um, uh, like resolution till now with so much of conflicting parties uh, and a negotiation taking place. And absolutely as the topic of my talk today, that women has been out, uh, not a part of this. But before I do that, let me uh, take you back to what the conflict in the Northeast means to all of us. The, the conflict in Northeast is South Asia's longest running conflict. It is happening from 1940, what is still present till today. Today we have more, so much of Northeast is militarized. Over 300,000 troops operate in the, our region. And as I mentioned, there are armed forces special spouse acting. If you look at the picture in the slide I'm showing, what do you think are these round things which one of these military people is carrying? I can't hear you all, but if you uh, um, think these are actually mine detectors. Uh, means for landmines. They're checking if there are landmines uh, in, in, in our region. So uh, Northeast of India is a very highly militarized zone. And this is how all of us grew up in. There are about 350 military stations all across Manipur and Northeast of India. Every half a kilometer has a military personnel operating. How many of us, many of you are so young, so much younger than me, but I grew up the day I was born, there was military curfew. My 14-year-old Lise died in this conflict in Manipur. She died in a bomb blast. How many family in the Northeast have no have a story to tell about how conflict has effect, affected each of our lives? So not just heavy militarization, we have also 70 armed groups operate in the Northeast of India. In my research, when I was a a student in Jawaharlal Nehru University, I've mapped out that weapons from 13 countries have flooded the Northeast of India. So 
absolutely like many of us who are listening and tuning in right now, many of us have grown up in a war zone, in a conflict zone. In fact, your parents' generation would have told you more stories than your current generation. But I have grown up in a generation of multi-generational where we have seen conflicts at different levels. And then, yes, because what happens is when your dignity is literally kicked, your, your, your history is blanked out. You face racism at multiple levels. You face violence at multiple levels. What does one do? Okay. So a lot of young people picked up arms in the Northeast of India. And so we have like what is called a very, very, very militarized conflictual zone. The next slide I'm showing is very, very important. And this is very pertinent, particularly in today's times, because one of the important parts of my, my research was looking at not just the origin of conflicts in Northeast of India, but we also documented there is a criminalization of politics happening in Northeast of India. And when Nidhu Tania died in 2014, Asian Age tried to portray that he was a drug addict. We took out a protest against, literally protest letter and a literally against Asian Age by saying, how dare you? How dare you call every young person from the Northeast as a drug addict? They paint our women as morally loose and are paint as young boys as being drug addicts. Now, one of part of my research while I was a JNU was not looking at why is conflict in the Northeast as I described, but I also looked at how come the Northeast has become an epicenter of the drug industry of India and don't blame it on the people of Northeast of India. The Northeast of India is juxtaposed between the Golden Triangle, which is drug producing area, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand. So there they grow a lot of poppy. You know, the poppy plant is a beautiful flower, but can you smoke poppy? No, you can't. You, you need chemicals to convert poppy into heroin. And guess who's supplying those chemicals to convert poppy into heroin? It's India. India is South Asia's largest producer of chemicals which turn poppy into heroin. So the Northeast of India became an area where a lot of these chemicals were flooding from Chennai, from Gujarat, from other parts of India, from the pharmaceutical industry. Fake pharmaceutical industries were set up in our indigenous area, which is then flushed into Myanmar and other parts. And that the finished product is pushed back into the Northeast and whose bags are not checked while you board a flight, the VIP's bags are not checked. Think for a moment. So the Northeast of India, that's why there's so much of criminalization in the Northeast of India. In fact, in Manipur, there are many like several, uh, you know, uh, drug traffickers who are now are members of the legislative assembly. Are they our leaders or are they destroying our region? It's a question which the younger generation needs to ask and take action. So because of this conflict in the Northeast of India and there are different layers of conflict. I've told you the origin of the conflict in Manipur. I've told you the origin of the Naga conflict, the origin of how the Mizo conflict, the conflict in Assam, the conflict in Tripura and how did it happen? These are everything that we, we got to understand. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, these issues in the Northeast of India. And as a result, we have one of the highest internally displaced people in the world. Um, I have visited many of these areas. The world knows about what's happening with the Rohingyas. Everyone heard about it, uh, but then the Northeast of India is home to over 300,000 IDPs, means internally displaced persons, okay, because of the conflict. And I think um, what is critical also to note is how this indigenous areas of Northeast of India, not just a political conflict and the political violence, but how this part of Northeast, our region has been used as a, as a laboratory, such as the National Register of Citizens in which 
It started in the Northeast Indian state of Assam and 1.9 million people are missing from the National Register of Citizens out of which 0.7 million are indigenous, equal number of Muslims and women. That's the gender impact. Women form 69% of those who are missing at the National Register of Citizens. And this is something before the coronavirus hit, this was really a contestation point. If you hear about detention camps around the world, in the Northeast of India, 30 detention camps are set up for housing many of the stateless people. Some of these uh, camps, again, are uh, right now they're in Assam, but they've been spring, uh, spring up in other parts of India too. So this is the Northeast of India, which is, as I mentioned, home to 45 million indigenous people have been repeatedly used time and again as external grounds for the politics of this country. And uh, the whole thing of Citizenship Amendment Act, which uh, rocked, it started in the Northeast of India, but because Indian media is not reporting it, so the Shaheen Bagh became more known than the Northeast of India. But the first protest against Citizenship Amendment Act, which tries to give Indian citizenship to migrants of certain religious communities, which the UN have called it extremely discriminatory, which violates the constitution of India, was aimed to get 2 million Hindus to gain Indian citizenship and settle them in parts of India's Northeast. So this is why the protest from the Northeast was very much vehement till uh, New Delhi and the world converted into a Hindu Muslim conflict. So this is where um, it's so important for our research to be known from the Northeast, done by the Northeast, people who report on the Northeast. Another critical thing which the conflict in the Northeast has happened is really important to what a term which I call population engineering. Why do people of Manipur ask for inner line permit? Why did um, all of these permits, which for me, uh, this is not good enough. Inner line permit is not good enough. It's, 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 it's an old British colonial uh, um, act, which was meant to protect uh, elephants, tea and oil. It was never meant to protect indigenous people. And there are two examples in front of us. If you've ever been to Tripura, what happened to the people of Tripura? Tripura has a very long, it's an independent, it was again like Manipur, Tripura was an independent Asiatic nation state. There was so much marriage alliances between Tripuri kings and Manipur uh, royal families. And if you uh, know S.D. Burman and R.D. Burman, which are the doyen of Indian film industries music, uh, they are, uh, they come from Tripura. In fact, S.D. Burman's um, mother was a Manipuri princess and the father came from the Tripura indigenous family, uh, royal family. So it, to this extent, this uh, cultural uh, you know, richness was there. But now the indigenous people of Tripura has been owned, reduced to 29% of its own population. Think for a moment what it means. The indigenous people of Tripura hardly have political representation. In fact, the chief minister of Tripura, Biplav, said that if CAB comes, NRC comes, because he has origins of a family from Tripura, he would not qualify to be an Indian citizen. So this is what he said himself over Twitter. And um, so this is how it has happened. Sikkim, what happened to Sikkim? Sikkim, indigenous people are the Bhutia Lepchas. Sikkim has very old ties with Bhutan too. In fact, the grandmother of, uh, the queen grandmother of Bhutan is a Sikkimist royal family person. But the Bhutia Leta people have been reduced to 23% of population. Sikkim was, uh, was flooded during the old uh, Indira Gandhi Congress regime with a lot of Nepali population. As a result, the indigenous Bhutia Lepcha community have introduced 23% of its population and they are not in political power. So this is what has happened already to what in the Northeast of India and the care that the people of Northeast India have to take care is, is this is not happening in other states. So what has happened? 
because of all of these factors, the political conflict, uh, you know, the militarization, the violence has resulted in 50,000 people killed in this conflict. Thousands have disappeared. The Northeast of India has so many extrajudicial executions. The reason why I started the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network is a lot of young men between the age of 17 or 40 are shot dead every day in Manipur, resulting in over 20,000 women widowed, according to official data. Our unofficial data says there are three times more women who are widowed in Manipur. The picture that you are seeing are women, mothers, holding a photograph of their loved ones who have been shot dead in extrajudicial executions in Manipur, my home state. This is why we do the work we are doing. For us, our work for gendering justice, gendering you know, peace, uh, gendering resistance is not because it's a project or I wanted to become a professor or something like that or set up an organization. When you see violence at very close quarters, you're left with two choices. Either you fight back or you cow down. We decided we will resist through our work. These are images of so many youth, young men, young children, women who have been killed. In the Supreme Court of India, we have 1,528 extrajudicial executions cases currently on. And mass graves have been uh, unearthed in Manipur, which were formerly occupied by Indian Armed Forces. Rape has been used as a weapon of war. 2004, the woman Tangja Manorama, 31 years old, was picked up from her house. I have been to her house. I've met her mother. And she lives in a, she's from a very poor household. And she was a weaver, but she was picked up on the charges of being someone supportive, the armed groups or something. And she was unarmed when she was captured at 12 in the night, in the middle of the night, by paramilitary Assam rifles. And at five o'clock, her dead body was found in the fields of Manipur with seven bullet wounds in her private part to destroy evidence of rape, resulting in one of the most extraordinary women's resistance in Manipur, where the mothers of Manipur went with this banner, Indian Army Rapers, to the Indian paramilitary headquarters asking, come and rape us, we are all Tangja Manorama's mothers. Uh, a, an act of nonviolent resistance which shook us, it shook the country and it shook the world. The United Nations have declared rape in conflict as a war crime. It cannot be done. Rape happens in India every 22 minutes. Every two, whether it's Manipur, whether it's Nagaland, whether it's Delhi or whether it's Mumbai or whether it's Uttar Pradesh. But rape in conflict area, literally what I call rape at gunpoint is something India hasn't woken up to. And we, the people of Northeast, we, the women of Northeast, we, the youth of Northeast have to raise these questions. And I'm gonna end and as per not everything in Northeast is tragic news. I always say between the word fortune and misfortune is just three words, M-I-S, fortune, misfortune. We, the people of Northeast of India have, who have grown up in deeply entrenched conflict zones. What do we do about it? I am a very hopeful person. The reason is if hope disappears, nothing else is left. We have got to remain hopeful that peace will dawn on us one day, that we will be treated as equal citizens of an equal country, that the Armed Forces Passes Powers Act is repealed from the indigenous territories of India's Northeast. Reason is that it is a British colonial act which should not be in the edifice of this country if it calls itself as the world's largest democracy. So, the positive story in the Northeast is the gendering of this resistance as a topic of today's talk. And let me come bring you through, through this. So how did the women of the Northeast 
gender resistance. This are image of Manipuri Mayra Paibis. The word Mayra means bamboo uh, torch. Paibi means the hand which bears this torch. So Manipur has a 104 year old women resistance movement. It started during the British time in 1904 in which women of Manipur protested against British colonial rule of forced labor. And then it started in 1939 again when the British colonial forces tried to create artificial food scarcity in Manipur. Women of Manipur resisted that act. So in Manipur today, if you come, we have the Nupi Lal Memorial, which is women's war memorial. So this is how, and when insurgencies started coming in Manipur in, 19, in late 1970s, and so many young people were picked up in the middle of the night, the women of Manipur started patrolling the streets at night with bamboo torches. That's the picture that you're seeing. So we have all across Manipur, we have a, what you call bamboo huts where women of Manipur, particularly our mothers and grandmothers generation, take turns at night. And whenever they see an army convoy coming, they take the stone and do clanging sound on the lamppost and people converge to physically tussle the boy or a girl being taken up into the paramilitary vehicle. This is the most amazing form of like resistance that I've seen anywhere in the world. I've, I've studied resistance and have spoken to resistance experts around the world, what the women of Manipur have done. And it is also what the important work done by the Naga Mothers Association, by the Cookie Mothers Association, by the Assamese women, by women across the Northeast, and particularly the women, Merapavis of Manipur. This is an extraordinary form of resistance, which is worth documenting and worth emulating and worth being an inspiring story that needs to be shared with almost everyone. So from the Mayrapai bees, yes, a lot of critique on the Mayrapai bees that there uh, comes also, and absolutely I understand that. So what did our generation do? You know, when I was a student like many of you, we also started looking at the questions of how do we look into this violence. Uh, many of us grew up in war zone and that's not the way to live. We have a right to life in peace and security, but it's not there happening in many parts of Northeast of India. So that's what we started in 2007, the Manipur Women's Gun Survivors Network. This is one of the stories which of gendering resistance because the resistance didn't end with the Manipur Mayrap IBs. The, our, our, uh, the Naga mothers, it's now taken by generations, you see, that's one. And your generation should take, take it up next after us. <laughs> well, and uh, we do it in many ways. Gendering resistance, you know, resistance is not just, you know, you take a placard or a banner and you march. Resistance is also when you do a good research, <laughs> you know. Resistance is also having a seminar like this, a webinar like this. Resistance also means economically empowering women across the Northeast of India. So our forms of resistance is just not a resistance against the conflict and violence and militarization. We realize that if women have to gender a resistance, I always say you cannot preach human rights on an empty stomach. You cannot do resistance when your stomach is empty, can you? Can you do your studies when your stomach is hungry? Can you do your work? When you're hungry, no. So as a result, what we did in the last decade was we set up many weaving villages across Manipur and we also did it in, in, in Assam, we also did it in uh, Tripura, where we try to raise women's economic empowerment model and we, we managed to raise women's income by 30 to 100%. So in Manipur, if you come and visit us someday, we have once a pandemic is over, of course, we have many weaving villages that we have set up. And in uh, 10 years ago, we started what is called the Northeast India Women Initiative for Peace. We have hosted two historic women peace congregations in Manipur and in, uh, and in uh, Assam. And for the first time, women from different warring ethnic groups came together for the first time in the history of Northeast of India. And we were able to meet and we actually hosting after a gap of several years, we're hosting the third 
Northeast India Women Peace Congregation on 21st November 2020. So if you're interested, you're most welcome to come and present your paper. Um, one of the important processes that we have learned is also there are 17 peace talks in India's Northeast. And there is not a single woman in these peace talks, not a single woman in these peace talks. Um, and so when women form 50% of Northeast population, how come? When women have been a part of negotiating peace, how come we are not there? So uh, I would like some of you may want to research. Uh, a couple of years, just two, two, three years ago, I co-edited a book with many other scholars called Where Are Our Women in Decision-Making? This is questioning the absence of women in many of these peace talks and peace negotiations. I'm happy to send this book across to your uh, college or anyone who's interested, but it's a very important book, which is based on United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. If you don't know about this resolution 1325, you better know this because this is so important for the people of Northeast of India. UN Security Council resolution 1325 talks about women in conflict. It talks about women in decision-making. So not just the work of protests or research, we also drafted legislation with supportive parliamentarians and drafted India's national action plan on women, peace and security which we submitted to the government of India. Also, the women of Northeast gender a resistance through evolving national action plan for racism and anti-racial law. We already made it with supportive lawyers from all across the Northeast of India. So if uh, you are interested, I'll be happy to help you with this. At the global level, we continue the resistance. We have been to the United Nations so many times we have shared our concerns with Human Rights Watch, with Freedom House and Nobel Women and many others. This is a picture when I spoke at the UN and this is a picture where I had met former US President Jimmy Carter. The reason that I'm showing this is to tell that our fight for justice and peace starts from a local level and it has to go to the regional level, the national level. And if the nation doesn't listen to us, we have to take it to the international level because the world is one body. It's not about going out and complaining India is not doing enough. For 15 years, if India didn't listen to what the people of Northeast are saying, we will take it to the UN where India is a member state and it's, a, it's our right to do so. We are from alliances with several uh, women initiatives uh, and around the world. Shirin Ibadi is the first woman uh, to get the Nobel Peace Prize. This is Shiran, uh, this Lema Gowi from Liberia. Um, Myrid is from Ireland and Jodie Williams is from United States. What is important to note is we've also built alliances with indigenous women leaders. As again, I repeat, Northeast of India is home to one of the largest indigenous populations in the world. And the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People protect our land resources and our territories. We can use international historic uh, documents such as this to fight for our rights. So um, I think I will end with uh, what is important is is how do we uh, I mean how do we resolve the issues that we're in? We got to repeal the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. We got to scrape the Discriminatory National Register of Citizens and Citizenship Amendment Act. We got to include the history of Northeast India in the school syllabi. Government of India to set up a truth and reconciliatory commission and develop a national action plan for an anti-racial law. So these are the work that um, we are doing that has been done on gendering resistance. Thank you, uh, the Northeast Society of St. Stephen's for inviting me and thank you to everyone who's tuned in and I'm happy to uh, connect with you, take questions, and continue this journey of exploring through research, writing, analysis, and advocacy to bring the change that we wish to see for the Northeast of India, for the country, and for the world. Thank you.
thank uh, so ma'am thank you for the talk it was a very informative and eye opening lecture so um, for now we have some questions that some people have asked so yeah. if you could uh, if you can access that or if you can access i could speak it out but if you can access that uh, if you, can you tell me if you can access the questions on the chat box i i can but i would love to hear uh, you all too so I, I let let's do it together you you put the questions i will reply okay okay so the first question is uh, ma'am i'll start with like there are around four questions and will you be able to take all of them okay sure sure so, i can yeah. uh, the first question is could you comment on the internal diversity within the northeast and how can it be used to mobilize political causes? Absolutely, this is a great question. As I mentioned, in the northeast of India is home to 272 indigenous communities. Put this in your head. The reason I say this is we are so diverse and more than 400 languages are spoken in the northeast of India. This is like a mini country, you know, the Northeast is like a mini India, you know, land of literally diversity. Yet, we do not understand, we, we, we are not reading about each other. Um, I was in Garbi Anglong uh, once, I traveled from Dimapur there, and I take out the Garbi Anglong newspaper because I always love to read local newspapers. So this is like four pages newspaper. It, it, it had local issues on the front page, it had issues about the uh, other, uh, you know, what's happening around India. And one page was full of like Kim Kardashian. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, things from, literally, I'm like shocked. The reason is, is I was imagining, all right, everyone loves popular stories and I'm not denying that. And we have a right to popular stories, but I was imagining if we could even have half a newspaper page on, What's happening in Nagaland? What's happening in Manipur? What's happening in Sikkim in that Karbi Anglong newspaper? How, um, how beautiful it would be. How would we learn from each other? Same thing with Manipur Sangai Express. You know, we have half a page, again, same thing in Manipur Sangai Express, which is the largest English editing newspaper. So the the, my comment on internal diversity within Northeast is we have an amazing rich diversity. Let's recognize this. Let's recognize this. Let's understand, read, understand about this. And once that is done, as I mentioned, we can raise our own consciousness on what's happening with each other. I always say once during the, um, so, okay, this is what I'm saying. We all learn about Rani Ki Jhansi, we learn about Ashoka the Great, but we are not learning about each other. So the Northeast of India could, uh, in our state governments should ensure in the education policy that we learn about each other. Once we do that, we realize how similar the struggle of Nagas are to the struggle of the Metis, to the struggle of you know, the Tripuris, the struggle of the, um, people in, in Karbi Anglong, the struggle of the Bodo people, the struggle of the Assamese people. Because we don't know each other. Someone somewhere in the capital is controlling and doing the same divide and rule. And that's how we could mobilize political causes. That's why um, I truly believe that the Northeast people should politically determine our own future. We should stop looking outside, literally. Because if that is being done, we will continue to be a land filled where the military rule is there, where we have so much infighting amongst each other, that in the end, someone is going to take away all our resources, which is under Nagaland, under Tripura, under Panipur, and we will continue to remain as impoverished societies. And if you know about Native American history, we may end up as reservations. I have many friends, Native American friends. I work very closely with them. We should resist that Northeast of India, indigenous people should not be put in reservations like it has happened in the United States. As a result, be able to determine our own political future 
This is such an important need of the hour. Please wake up and please tell your elders in your states to wake up too. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And the second question is, uh, how would you say the presence of the military impacts the mental state of the Northeastern states? Absolutely. Militarization is, is, is a state where of constant, where a gun is pointed at you. Imagine in, in, in your college, if there is military in St. Stephen's, if there's military in our rice fields, there are military in our schools, do you think you could act normally? Militarization is a disease which has infected 45 million citizens of the Northeast of India. It's not normal. I understand how military is important for defending the territories of a country. I get that. And we are not saying, oh, India or the world should dispense with military. A military person is trained to deal with the enemy. I repeat, an army personnel, a military person is trained to handle the enemy. You do not make your own citizens enemy of your own country, do you? So uh -huh. as a result, what has happened is the militarization of Northeast has created, has made us a, into a de facto colony of India. That's why we are asking for the repeal that if India wants to be known as the world's largest democracy, we're advising India, women of Northeast of India are advising India for the last decade and a half that India must repeal its military laws. Nelson Mandela said that uh, you do not negotiate. Unequals do not negotiate, cannot negotiate. If you are at gunpoint and asked to negotiate, that's not an equal negotiation. So the militarization of Northeast has impacted people of Northeast in three ways. First, it has made all the people of Northeast suspects under this armed forces special by as suspects. We are all, every single person in Northeast is suspect mm. in the eyes of the law, number one. So even an unborn child of a Northeast is a suspect already without you know, anything. So that is how it has impacted our mental health. It has impacted how many people in Northeast have post-traumatic stress syndrome because of this conflict and because of the military. Second, it has really impacted women and children of the Northeast with so much of sexual violence in conflict happening. And third, it has destroyed our polity. It has destroyed our environment because militarization is not just about military presence, contamination of indigenous land resources of territory, wherever there are uh, in military or you know, landmines or bombings, that area is contaminated with chemicals and which hurts the health of the indigenous people of land. So this is how militarization has impacted and most particularly your important point of the mental health of the people of Northeast of India. We, so much of uh, depression, so much of pain, as I mentioned, if we realize for me, studying this conflict in JNU, researching, writing healed me, arts healed, that's why please, do that to yourselves to write a poem, sing a song, compose a rap music. I mean, do anything to take, because one of the reasons why we are not able to come out of our marais is because we don't understand what's happening. So research, writing, understanding, listening to what people have done and try to find solutions as they remain positive. And that's how we could deal with this mentally with the militarization of our bodies, minds, societies, communities. And uh, thank you, ma'am. And the third question is, given that national identity is explicitly race-based, how do you think integration of the Northeast region with the rest of India can be carried forward? Um, yeah. And uh, uh, can I also remind you that there are two more questions. So, uh, and since there is a time constraint. Sure. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. okay. I'll, I'll reply quickly. Okay. Uh, you can take your time. It's like, it's fine. But I like, just be aware of the constraint. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, see, the, na the, the only way in which um, the Northeast of India, I, it, it's not integration. It is it's about India realizing that this is a country of diversity as enshrined in the constitution is a secular republic. And the unit of India must evolve policies as per the Besborough Committee report, which uh, we were members and we negotiated that together, uh, that India must have a national diversity policy in which even if the Anal ethnic community, which is just a few hundreds of thousands in numbers, could feel that they are safe and secure, that their language, their identity is protected and not bulldozed over by, by the nation of India. And same thing, um, the BGP government is trying to say <laughs> that, uh, for example, Manipur is a Hindu state. It isn't, it isn't. M Manipur is a state, uh, it's an indigenous state where Hinduism was literally forced in the 17th century to the people, indigenous people of Manipur. And that's why the divide between hills and Man valley of Manipur is precisely in the hills Christianity went and in the valley Hinduism was forced. The indigenous scripts of Manipuri people were burned by the Hindus at that time. So uh, India in 2020 and the remaining years have to have a national diversity policy, evolve an anti-racial law so that to protect the people of Northeast of India, only then, and, uh, and, and, and that will allow that we should be treated and treated as equal citizens of an equal country. Then we will and, and have this equal po political participation in the Indian parliament only then, till now it's so unequal. So, okay. Thank you. And the fourth question is, given that the Naga peace talks and the hopeful resolution of the Naga insurgency movement might lead to territorial disintegration of Manipur, Arunachal yeah. Pradesh, and uh, some other areas as well, how do you think the people of Manipur and you know the affected areas ensure that there is minimal violence and ethnic tensions in Manipur, as well as the entire Northeast region? Okay, so thank you for your question. And this is really pertinent particularly as Naga peace talks enters, you know, year 22, you know, since 1997. I mean, many of you may have not been even born then, I don't know. But it's like, it's going on for like 22 years. And I have one of my PhD that I started in January was actually on peace accords. I looked at the Mizo peace accord and the Chittagong peace accord in Bangladesh. So I looked at the two peace accords um, because of, um, so, in terms of uh, the peace talks in Northeast of India uh, uh, and having studied the uh, Mizo peace talks, the peace talks in India ha have not been really sincere. <laughs> Historic peace talks have been not sincere. It is not about ensuring that the people who are fighting, the community fighting for its, its, uh, its sovereignty, its self-determination, um, has not been really, the, the history of peace talks hasn't shown this. In fact, there's a book, if you're interested, called Accord into Discord. We, it lists all the peace talks in the Northeast and why it has failed. And that's why, I'm, that's why I worry about the Naga peace talks, that um, it is not being done. It's so much of hard work which has gone into the Naga peace talks. Uh, and one of the reasons that as, uh, in, now that we're talking about gendering resistance, what I feel is, is women have been excluded from these peace talks. Include the Naga women and let's see how it, it takes. <laughs> this is the new dimension. And regarding the fear of disintegration of Manipur and other parts, I would put it this way. Um, I have met several Naga leaders um, and my plea to them is this. The Northeast of India, as I've described in the last like half an hour or more, is a land of what, more than 272 indigenous communities with multitudes of struggle. We got to unite our strategies for resistance to be able to get the justice, the peace and the dignity that we need. 
It's a time to unite. It is not a time for letting a fissure come through. That is a new stage in Northeast of India. Um, you know, ethnic politics that I would like to see. So, I mean, um, I'm like the disintegration of Manipur and Arunachal. I mean, if you haven't read this book called Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities, please take a reading and all of you read together this book, Benedict Anderson's. In this book, it says nations can be created. You know, all of us in this uh, you know, webinar could create a nation together, you know. So the Naga resistance is a remarkable resistance. And it's going to take a while before a solution is reached. And it has to be taken collectively, taking it to confidence, different communities. And so for me, this is a work in progress. Uh, lands cannot be just disintegrated. You know, this is one earth for all of us. We have to coexist. Coexistence is the key. So uh, that's the way I would look at that our indigenous leaders must sit together, including women indigenous leaders, and negotiate together our idea of a sovereign, self-determined Northeast. This is how I would answer this question. So ma'am, uh, this is the last question. And uh, so the last question is, mm. under this ruling dispensation, there has been a strong push towards homogenizing cultural history by linking indigenous communities to the Indo-Aryan cultural history. Besides resisting militarization and conflict, how do we stand up to this new challenge to preserve our distinct history and fight this push to assimilate indigenous people to the dominant culture? Absolutely. This is the challenge um, that um, India is facing and already with what we are seeing with the rape of the Dalit girl, 19 year old, it has become like a caste war in India at the current times. And it is worrying how there is a push uh, to create an India of one religion. Um, and I understand the perspective from those uh, people, but this is, this is so wrong to many other minority indigenous communities. So my plea, first of all, is to those who are trying to push through homogenizing the cultural history of India, please stop it. India is already a land of more than 88% Hindus. You don't have to worry that you would be like become minorities in India, already a majority. So why worry about that? In fact, it would be in India's interest to ensure that Indigenous community, minority communities, the marginalized communities should be absolutely given a place under the sun and to be able to let their cultures be an example, be an exa so much that we learn from each other. So as I mentioned, this militarization, the, the population engineering going on is so wrong and we got to resist this. And how do we resist this? It's a great question, great last question. How do we resist? First of all, I would like all of us to know what is there in the Indian constitution because it's a very ideal constitution which no one is following, even the policymakers, not even the parliamentarians. They're thwarting the constitution of this country. So look at the constitution of India and then quote from there to fight this out because according to Indian constitution, you cannot discriminate anyone on the base of race, gender, region, caste. So use the Indian uh, constitution to fight for what you feel is our rights to our indigenous culture. Second, please read the UN declaration on the rights of indigenous people developed in the year 2007. UN declaration on the rights of indigenous people. I repeat, because this was a really important document which I discovered and which I work very closely with some, uh, with the global indigenous community. I'm a founder of the Global Alliance of uh, Indigenous People, Gender, Justice and Peace. And so please look into this global UN documents of which India is a, a member of the United Nations, have a right to protect the indigenous people, rights, lands, resources and territories. So if, if anyone 
is pushing the Northeast culture, uh, tradition, language, our food habits, our music, um, everything, our uh, clothes, our way of life, our stories to be inundated by an Aryan cultural history we are going to say under the Indian Constitution, under the UN Declaration of Human Rights, you are thwarting it. And so this is against international humanitarian law to do it. So we must know our, our um, uh, Constitution. We must know what is uh, uh, the, the, the sovereign rights of the indigenous people, because indigenous people, we had our own kind of uh, ways of life and governance. As I mentioned, the Manipur constitution was formed before India had its own constitution. So know our history, know what we are, be, be, be mindful of who we are, be proud of who we are. That's why I'm wearing what I'm wearing. Uh, it's woven by the women of Manipur. Be proud of your culture, be proud of who you are because you can make the difference. All of us can make the difference. And um, let's resort to some of these global international norms, our own norms in the nation, use them, and we will fight this out together. Thank you so much for the talk, ma'am. Uh, it was a very uh, insightful talk, and I, I am pretty sure that most of us who attended this uh, lecture uh, have come out of this discussion with, uh, with a new lens to view politics and how to watch it from a very sort of feminist lens as well. And uh, so uh, I got some messages asking me if you could uh, type down the books that you recommended because uh, some of us couldn't hear properly or we, we couldn't find it online. So if you could send it on mail or even if you could type, on, type it on Zoom, that's, not, that's fine, uh, it's your call. Benedict Anderson's book, Imagine yeah, Community. Uh, I found it in the uh, library of uh, Imagine Community. It's one book which you must read. Uh, man, uh, is, I called into Discord, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It's online. Please read this for everyone in Northeast. This should be a must document. UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples is 2007. And once the pandemic is on, you can come to the United Nations and attend the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous People. You must be a part of this. And yes, accord into discord. Oh, uh, accord into discord actually is a report from an organization. Let me like, but there are, uh, there is a book which I used while I was at Delhi University, which look into all the peace accords. Let me dig it out and send it to you. And then you can, uh, yeah. Accords into discords is, um, is, is I think was there is a report, try to find it online. You'll find reconciliation resources and many other conflict resolution organizations from around the world has discussed so many peace accords. And uh, yeah, I hope this is useful. And yes, and try to find my book, South Asia's Fractured Frontier, if you have it in your library. It's in Delhi University Library. Frontier, because my, my research findings have been published into a book called South Asia's Fractured Frontier by Metal Publications. So thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. That like we'll make sure that we read those and like yeah, yeah thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for for inviting and have a good evening. And I'm happy to um, have some other conversations uh, in the next year, whatever. And okay, thank okay, you. Yeah, we'll, take, yeah. take care, all of you. Okay, okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.